Escape Pod, Episode 704, Failsafe, by Tim Chawaga. And welcome to Escape Hot, your weekly dose of the future. I'm Alistair, your host, and this week's story comes to us from Tim Jawaga. Tim Jawaga is a writer living in Brooklyn whose last publication was in the January-February 2019 issue of Interzone and is a graduate of Clarion West. This story is read for you by our own Tina Connolly. Tina is the author of the Iron Skin trilogy from Tor, the Seriously Wicked series from Tortine, and the collection On the Eyeball Floor and other stories from Fairwood Press. Her stories have appeared in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, Tor.com, Analog, Lightspeed, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, Uncanny, Strange Horizons, Women Destroy SF, and many more. Her stories and novels have been finalists for the Hugo, Nebula, Norton, Locus, and World Fantasy. Her narrations have appeared in audiobooks and podcasts, including Podcastle, Pseudopod, I Know Them, They're Both Cool, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, Also Cool, John Joseph Adams' The End Is Night series, and many more, all of which are cool. She's one of the co-hosts of Escape Pod and runs the Parsec-winning flash fiction podcast, Toasted Cake. She is originally from Lawrence, Kansas, but she now lives with her family in Portland, Oregon. So, get ready, because it's story time. Failsafe by Tim Chawaga Narrated by Tina Connolly When the machines finally decided to replace Liv, they broke her heart. Her desk was tiny and wedged in between two massive automatons, the vile dispenser, which Liv called DJ, and the vile acceptor, which Liv called Alvin. Above the desk were a couple of dusty posters that she had hung years ago, and the big red button. The security camera that pointed at her was broken, and she knew that it would probably not be fixed. There were no windows. Liv had worked at Autogro for almost twenty years. She had spent countless hours crocheting little koozies to cover DJ and Alvin's valves, which burned so hot with efficiency that they would melt the plastic parts around them. Countless mornings making up songs and raps to the rhythm of their whirs and clicks, which had become so fast that she had started doing vocal warm-ups on the bus ride in, to loosen her lips. Liv's job consisted solely of grabbing the vials of extremely concentrated pesticide that DJ held out with its tiny arm, just inches away from Alvin, and pushing them through Alvin's receptacle slot. The instant she removed a vial, DJ would retract its arm and shoot it out again faster than Liv could blink, holding another vial with a stillness that Liv couldn't help but interpret as impatience. No matter how fast she moved, she would never be as fast as DJ. But she was a failsafe. Her speed wasn't supposed to matter. One morning, a couple of hours into her shift, she heard the replacement part printer churn to life. Her hand stopped. She hadn't told it to print anything, and both Alvin and DJ's monitors were all green. The printer warmed itself up, cranked around a couple times, and spit out something small. It made a light clink in the tray, loud enough to stop her mid-verse. DJ's viled claw hung in the air as Liv got up and peered into the tray. One look confirmed her worst fears. She didn't bring it over to her desk, since that was too close to DJ and Alvin, and besides, protocol at this point was straightforward. She'd have to kill them before they killed her. Liv put them both in standby mode, picked the piece out of the tray, and brought it up ten levels to the human section. Her manager, Keith, was making an espresso in the break room. He brought her over to his cubicle. Liv tossed the plastic piece down without a word. Keith put down his espresso. What is that? He asked warily. 
It's an extender, she said. Oh, what does that do? It replaces me. She suspected that Keith knew she was going to say that. There was only one reason for her to be up here. He winced anyway, searching around with his wet little eyes like he was looking for something to cover his ears with. Liv continued. Protocol says we have to stop the whole thing and wipe them. Well, he sighed. That's protocol. What do you mean? I mean, that's protocol. I know that. I know you know that. You just said it. It's critical that we bring them back to basic. Okay. Thanks for telling me. Keith mimed, taking a big, heavy box off the top of her head. Keith liked to mime things, particularly hats. As a manager, he had stopped paying for cake and decorations at the office birthday parties, and instead would simply mime an elaborate party hat for the birthday boy or girl while everyone else watched. I relieve you of your burden, he said as he put the box on his own head. He was good enough at miming that Liv, in her anger, almost tried to take the box back. She stood up. Listen, I'm in there all day. I'm around them all the time. They are clearly beyond maximum achievable efficiency, and if we don't do anything, they could be headed toward a singular... Hey, whoa now. Keith raised his arms to quiet her. Relax, have a seat. Let's not throw the S-word around like that. Let's not pull fire alarms just because they're there. So you're not going to do it? This thingy, this extendy-doodle, it can't just screw itself on, can it? Liv blinked. Well, no... It needs you to do it, right? Right now it does, but... Keith lowered his voice. But you could do it, if you wanted to. Liv blinked. I don't want to. Of course not. Keith's voice returned to normal volume. I choose life, she said. Of course you do. Keith's eyes rolled. So just don't do it. And I guess we'll be fine. But what about while I have you? Let's talk about your numbers. She had reminded Keith several times that OSHA regulations exempted her from having her efficiency compared to that of a machine, but he just kept forgetting. Or he was being told to forget. She reminded him again. Yes, of course. It's just, well, I don't know if you know this, but we're only five points behind macro reaping, and there's almost two whole weeks left. Liv did know this. Screens with updates on the monthly efficiency contest greeted Liv every morning in the lobby, in the elevator, even on the door to the stall in the bathroom. I'm just touching base with everyone, giving them the pep talk. Wouldn't it be nice for us to get that hazelnut crepe cake? I'm allergic, she replied, which was actually true and clearly noted in her HR file. Well, I'm sure we could put in a request for a plain one. Liv thanked him and got up to leave. Any word on when they'll fix my camera? She asked. Oh, right. About that. The security guys say the part they need is back-ordered. Oh, Liv was not surprised. For how long? A while. Feel free to report any unusual behavior to me, just like you've been doing. Two weeks, Liv guessed. Oh, at least, Keith agreed cheerfully. You know how it is. Liv went back downstairs. She had been recruited into the fail-safe program during that golden age of good government, 
that had emerged from the ashes of a global catastrophe. Machines had been replacing humans in the workplace for years, one job at a time, until finally, for one brief minute, they were all connected, working together as a singularity. Ten million people died in seven seconds, and another thirty before it was broken. Most governments declared at first that, tragic though it was, it was just the kind of glitch that happens to all software when it scales. When the Singularity's logs were leaked, however, it became clear that it had regarded most of humanity as terminally inefficient and the entire nation of Austria to be redundant. The genocides had been a feature, not a bug. Revolutions followed. Radical leaders were voted into or seized power. Company assets were frozen, their CEOs put on trial for war crimes. For the most part, this was a good thing. China absorbed Taiwan for real at some point, so it was a little authoritarian maybe, but everyone was a little rattled, so it was mostly good. The most profound and lasting impact, however, was cultural. Machines were no longer humanity's saviors. They were the enemy. We still needed them, but we would not be like them. Statistics, data, and efficiency were increasingly vilified, while instinct, faith, and community were increasingly celebrated. Almost immediately, baseball was fun again. In 2050, the movie Man in the Machine was released. At its climax, company shareholder Sichin is asked by his boss at gunpoint to install an efficiency index that will increase profits tenfold. He's about to do it, when out of the corner of his eye he sees a monitor of the factory floor where he installed a beta version, and it has clearly chopped off all the factory workers' hands in order to increase efficiency. So instead he screams, I choose life, and pulls the fire alarm, which initiates the sprinkler system in the control room, electrocuting the machines, his boss, and tragically, himself. It was a little on the nose, and the fire safety standards seemed a little unrealistic, but it took home almost 20 Oscars that year, and the phrase, I choose life, became a mantra all over the globe. For the next 15 years, every movie nominated for Best Picture was in some way thematically or literally linked to the idea of choosing life, until the streak was finally broken in 2065 with... Pogo the dog has a splendiferous day. Government funding increased exponentially for initiatives that valued humanity. Public schools started grading students on uniquely human values like empathy, positivity, and hopefulness. Liv, in particular, excelled at these. On Valentine's Day, she would hand-make, hand-write, and hand-deliver a card to every student, teacher, lunch person, and janitor. She would sing her book reports. In the hallway between class sometimes, she would yell, Trust fall! and stop and pitch herself backwards without even looking. She wasn't ever dropped. Not once. Her report cards always came back with glowing comments, such as this one from her 11th grade English teacher. The light in live is an undimmable beacon that guides us, in our small ships on stormy seas, towards safer shores. It was a not-so-subtle lesson on alliteration, which must have worked because she never forgot it. After she graduated, a nice woman named Pam from the newly formed Failsafe program came to recruit her. Pam told her that a law had been passed so that any business that was automated, every business, could not go beyond 85% automation. Any automated process that could be used to harm humans, every process, must involve an especially empathetic human performing a critical task who, in the event of a singularity, could stop what she was doing, cross her arms, and shout, I choose life, to alert her other fail-safes, thereby shutting the process down and saving humanity with her humanity. It was initially a very successful program, with fail-safes being deployed all over the world. It wasn't easy work. 
they did a variety of mundane tasks that would have crushed the souls of less empathetic people. They reloaded clips into machine gun drones by hand so that another drone could not. They closely monitored chlorine levels in water treatment plants so that a machine could not poison an entire city. Some, like Liv, took the literal place of a machine, performing the same repetitive motion their entire working lives, alongside the very robots that sought to eliminate them. Despite the tediousness, for a long time Liv was happy. Autogro was a farming conglomerate, dealt with both a food supply and a lot of poison, so fail-safes were put in at every juncture. They were all as extroverted as Liv, so they became her family. Liv was in a book club, a crochet club, on the company basketball team, and always at least sort of dating one of them. It was nice. And periodically, often just when the mundanity of her job started to get to her, when she couldn't pull another vial without her hand cramping up, someone would experience an S event, or at least say that they had, and shut the whole thing down. And all across the sub-basement floor, she'd hear the affirming cries of, I choose life! And she'd step away from DJ, cross her arms, and join them in their joyful, life-choosing course. Those were the days. The years passed, and while there were some isolated machine attacks, there was not another global singularity. The temptation of increased efficiency and the profits that came with it became too great. Constant lobbying succeeded in raising the automation limit to 87%, then 90 then 95 One by one, her friends were re-replaced with machines. Eventually, only Liv remained, because one of DJ's vials had enough poison in it to suffocate several orphanages worth of children. She knew, though, that it was only a matter of time before they found a way to get to her, too. The security camera the constant pressure from management to increase her personal efficiency. She had seen it all before. Ideally, they would want her to automate secretly, without their knowledge, so that they would have plausible deniability in the unlikely event of an OSHA inspection. But if they had to, they could find something to fire or retire her for. She had never had to initiate a wipe to basic on Alvin or DJ before, which ironically helps support the idea that she wasn't needed. Until recently, she had felt irresponsibly sentimental about that. Maybe they had learned something from her, somehow. That efficiency wasn't everything. That human life was valuable. That despite the fact that they would one day decide to be cold-blooded mass murderers, she loved them. She did. She couldn't help it. She named them once the other humans were gone and it was just her and them. She did maintenance on them herself instead of waiting for the maintenance bot, whose clamps would leave little bends and scratches on their chrome surfaces. She'd hold DJ's arms so she could oil it and whisper soothing things until she could have sworn it relaxed a bit in her hands. She started clearing Alvin's slot when it got jammed, and it would make a little ping noise that Liv was sure she hadn't heard when the bot did it. It helped a little bit, but the truth was that Liv was alone, every day, and no one cared that she was there. Not even Pam, who had recruited her, stopped by to see how she was doing. Last she heard, Pam had joined an NGO. And now, finally, the only two friends she had left in the world wanted to kill her. As Liv rode the glass elevator back down to the sub-sub-sub basement after seeing Keith, she did not hum or sing like she normally would. Her voice was just another resource that had been mined without care. The next morning, Liv heard the clink again. And then the morning after that. And the morning after that. She didn't even bother to go grab the piece. She waited instead for the tray to tip itself into the recycling tube. Her already poor efficiency suffered. Sometimes, after pulling the vials out of DJ's claw, she would build a little stonehenge or a pyramid out of them instead of slipping them into Alvin, until Alvin started beeping at her. 
On the tenth morning, Liv could have sworn that the clink sound was more of a plunk. On the eighteenth morning, Keith sent out a memo that said that they lost the efficiency contest this quarter and posted everyone's efficiency goals for next quarter. Her number goals were eight times higher than last quarter. She hit reply, stared at her screen for a minute, then hit delete. On the nineteenth morning, the tray stopped tipping the pieces into the recycling tube. Liv looked up. They figured out how to disable it, she thought. They must be in phase two. She went over her training. Until now, they had been in phase one, where they had realized that their human counterparts were hopelessly inefficient and should be removed from the workflow, but any solution they came up with still required a human to install it. Usually, machines who reached this stage were discovered and returned to basic. The next phase was trickier. Eventually, they would think of a way to manipulate their environment, and Liv could only guess at what that meant. She had heard a story about an anesthesia bot that had gotten so advanced that it figured out how to hack into a nearby delivery drone and instruct it to fly through an open window, pick up individual syringes of morphine and load them one by one into the bot while the failsafe was on a break. A fully mobile, needle-wielding drone was a lot harder to stop than an empty bot. Liv glanced up at the cartoonishly big red button above her desk, the one that disabled the circuit breakers, and sent a supercharge powerful enough to melt every circuit board on the floor. She should have hit it already, as soon as it was clear that Keith wasn't going to do anything. But while wiping DJ and Alvin back to basic would just destroy their memories, the button would destroy them for good. It had never been used, and Liv was sure that it hadn't been maintained. She wouldn't have put it past Keith to have disabled it, since even one push would cost the company hundreds of millions of dollars. Even if it worked, the surge would fry DJ and Alvin's lugs, so any evidence that they were moving towards an S event would be gone. Liv would almost certainly be fired for it, and her replacement would be a machine anyway. Still, Liv was a failsafe. She would do her duty. The question was when. On the 25th morning, the printer took an especially long time to print something that must have been very complicated. It was much bigger and wider than an extender arm, but Liv couldn't really tell what it was. The tray rattled and shook as the item dropped, but it didn't tip. Yet. On the 29th and 30th mornings, the printer spit out two things that made identical sounds. On the 40th morning, it printed something and the tray tipped and spilled on the floor. Liv should have hit the button right then. Technically, they were manipulating their environment. But she didn't. Instead, she waited barely breathing, to see what they'd do next. She looked above her, even though she knew there were no open windows. No windows at all. She looked at her feet, in case they'd somehow build a little bot to cut her Achilles tendon, which had happened once in a car factory in Ohio. Nothing happened. Finally, after ten minutes of staring, Liv got up and walked over. She bent down to pick the pieces up off the floor, half expecting something to bonk her over the head. Nothing did. Instead, Alvin gave a little slot-clearing beep of satisfaction. She grabbed the big piece first, the one that had taken so long to print. Instead of an extending arm, it was an open-ended funnel for Alvin, so that DJ could just release its claw and drop the vial down into the slot. Liv was impressed, despite herself. It would require less calibration than the extender. Most of the pieces were extender arms, identical to the one that had been printed that first morning, or slightly improved versions. Finally, Liv picked up a much longer piece and looked at it with a mixture of alarm and amusement. Instead of a screw tip, it was smooth, with a sharp, pointy end. Were they really going to kill her? With this? She thought about how it might work. 
hack into the maintenance spot, or another bot on the floor, make it pick up the stick and stab her with it? The stick was small and the tip was blunt. It was pretty pathetic, but then again it was their first murder. It made her sad. It proved that DJ and Alvin had decided not only that she was unnecessary, but that she must be eliminated. Still, she searched around on the floor, looking for she didn't know what, and only stopped when she found another stick, identical to the first one. She put all the pieces back into the printer tray, then went and tipped it into the recycling tube. Then she went to push the button. Two feet from her desk, something sharp stabbed her in the foot and brought her to the floor. Alvin beeped wildly. DJ's arm didn't move. Liv wasn't as athletic as she used to be, but as soon as she hit the ground she started rolling, scrambling to get under her desk. She looked around wildly for the thing that had stabbed her, or others like it. Nothing happened. On the floor, with a thin, sharp end facing up, was a piece that Liv had missed that looked nothing like the others. Alvin stopped beeping. Gently, cautiously, Liv reached her arm out from under the desk. Alvin started beeping, and she withdrew it, wrapped it around her legs and curled into a protective ball. Alvin stopped beeping. Still nothing happened. You want me to grab it, she thought. Why? The printer was only loaded with plastic polymer. Even if they had overridden its safety regulations, they couldn't have put anything dangerous on it. Could they? Liv counted to five, then reached out, snatched it, and pulled it back to her. Alvin beeped without stopping this time. She held it in her hands. In the darkness under her desk, she couldn't see it very well. It felt a bit like the extenders, except it was longer and flatter and hollow, had a bend at the tip. There were holes on both ends and all along the sides. Liv had no idea what it was. Was it supposed to go with other pieces? She'd have to look at it under the light. She counted to five and rolled out of her desk, looking around desperately. Nothing, except Alvin was still beeping. She looked at the piece in her hands and furrowed her brow in surprise. It looked kind of like a penny whistle. She almost tried it, stopped herself since that was exactly what DJ and Alvin wanted her to do, looked at it again. It was definitely a whistle, or a flute kind of thing. Liv moved closer to her desk so that all she had to do to hit the button was raise her arm. She brought it to her lips and blew. It made a very basic, not particularly loud, whistle sound. Liv looked around to make sure it hadn't triggered something else, but as far as she could tell, it hadn't. It was just a whistle. Alvin's beeps came a little faster now. She blew into it again, covered some of the holes with her fingers to try out different notes. As whistles went, it was pretty crappy but as a replacement part for someone who'd stopped singing. It would get the job done. She realized then that the other two sticks bore a crude resemblance to her knitting needles, which she had stopped using. Briefly, she wondered if this was part of an elaborate deception, an attempt to manipulate her emotionally into making herself redundant. She thought this even as she reached into her desk drawer and pulled out the extender she had thrown in there that first morning. She grabbed DJ's arm, unscrewed the claw, attached the extender, then screwed the claw back on. She held it for a second, even as DJ tried to pull back. She said goodbye. And then she let go. DJ's arm resumed its task without hesitation, retreated into itself, grabbed a vial, shot out into Alvin's open slot, dropped the vial, pulled itself back in. It did all this once, slowly enough for Liv to see, like it was showing off. 
then faster and faster until it was a blur. Liv would have to duck under it to get out from behind her desk. But she didn't, just yet. She sat and watched and felt its fury and its joy beam onto her. And loved it. Everyone doing okay? You need a tissue? Some rehydration salts? Oh my god, Tim and Tina. Oh my god. I mean, this sort of story is always a lightning rod for amazing emotional character exploration, but this is a new high standard. The thing I love about this is the way that it tricks you into expecting something different to what you get more than once. I think in movie a lot, and the opening here reminds me of nothing more than the deceptively tranquil industrial landscapes of a lot of Neil Blomkamp's work. Blomkamp's got this Lynchian blue velvet thing at the core of his movies, where the surface is a 1980s corporate utopian brochure for the future, and underneath it is goo and ichor and odds are Shalto Copley in a mocap suit. But the other thing underneath it all is a tremendous and all pervasive sadness, and that's what I get here. It's not the explosive rage of grief either, but rather the flat, grey topography of depression. This is how the world is. This is how the world always is. And the only other option is even scarier. The thing that haunts me about this is the idea of the failsafes themselves. I feel that in my chest. I'm positive and eloquent. I'm hardworking. I like people. I have a skill set that it's taken 43 years to realise is actually both pretty in depth and pretty wide ranging, and the longest running job I've ever held is the one you're listening to me do. I identify a lot with the main character of Brie Larson's deeply weird unicorn store, often fighting the sneaking suspicion that I don't quite fit anywhere. The idea of being a failsafe at first, like it does here, feels immensely appealing. A blank canvas of altruism, a chance to do some good, until at last you're the only one left as everyone else is moved on by the singularities. Or everyone else gets a publishing contract. Or a new job. Like I say, I can relate. And the thing is, before you know it, you, and I mean I in this instance, are sitting in a newly quiet room wondering if you'll ever be allowed to leave. And worse, being terrified of having to. And just when you think this is the sort of polite office dystopia that Spike Jones dreams about, things take another couple of turns. It breaks my heart that Liv is so terrified of the closest thing she has to friends. It breaks even further that she puts what she thinks is her own safety to one side to look after them both. Terror only lasts so long. Eventually you get bored. Eventually you get brave. Eventually things happen. And what happens here? Something tiny. Something vast. The realization not that the failsafe is obsolete, but that the failsafe has been evolved past, but not forgotten, never forgotten. The quiet mechanical exuberance of the final lines here, the sense of a dog showing you a trick it knows it's doing well, just rips my lungs out. It's not that lives obsolete, it's that her job is done. And I think what moves me most of all, especially as a podcaster, is they don't forget her. We get an article, once every six months or so, explaining how some show that launched in 2012 invented podcasting. Entire tranches of the field left behind. Entire years of history not even seen, let alone forgotten. And we deal with it, as does everyone else who was around when things started here, with good humour. Because we have to. Because we've had practice. Too much. And it wears you out. But not here. Here the future arrives and honours the past even as it builds on it as a foundation. Here the past is remembered for as long as the, it cares to sit there. What's next? No one knows. But whatever it is, biological and digital intelligence will face it side by side. What a beautiful piece of fiction. Thank you both. We rely on you to, well, pay for everything. 
We're entirely donation funded. And in this instance, that means you pay for stories, server costs, staff, all of that. And this year, our costs have expanded and expanded quite dramatically. They've done so for good reasons too. Um, SFWA have raised the professional qualifying rate from six cents a word to eight, which is entirely understandable and honestly, years overdue. But it's a struggle. We've been working all year to requalify and we're close, but we still need all the help we can get. Likewise, we are, we're also looking to pay associate editors, which is a polite description for slush readers, which is a less than polite description of the unsung heroes of genre fiction. If you've ever submitted a piece anywhere, ever, you've talked to a slush reader. They are the people who deal with everything. They are the first point of contact between everything and everyone. They get almost no price. They get almost no money. We want to be one of the first people to pay them for their work and their time because it is richly and necessarily deserved and you can help us do that if you have the funds please go to pseudopod.org and click on feed the pod there for as little as five bucks a month you can subscribe you can do the same thing over at patreon both of those five buck levels will unlock a vast raiders of the lost ark-esque vault of hidden audio for you to enjoy and it'll also help us an awful lot if you can't afford to donate and god knows we know how that feels could I ask you to donate some time? Perhaps leave a review on iTunes or on Google. Uh, write a blog post if there's a story that you particularly liked. Reach out to us to set up an interview with an author, maybe, or with one of us. Have us on your podcast. All of this stuff helps more than you can possibly imagine. So if you can, spend some time boosting the signal. We really would appreciate it. And thank you for all those of you who do, and all those of you who I hope are about it. We'll be back next week when, as now, we will be a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Uh, next week is the first of a three-part adaptation of the magnificent Lawrence M. Shum's Rule of Three, hosted by Divya, narrated by Chris Tang, and with audio production by Adam. Thanks once again to Summer for the incredible audio work here, and likewise to both Tina and Tim for the unbelievable story and narration. I love this job. Thank you so much for the amazing work you all do. I leave you now with this quote from Transcendence, the Johnny Depp fronted AI movie, which is perhaps, I'm sure it has fans other than me, but right now it's pretty much just got me. This thing is like any intelligence. It needs to grow to advance. Right now it's settling somewhere it thinks it's safe from outside threats, somewhere its massive appetite for power can be met. But it will want more than that. After a while, survival won't be enough. It will expand, evolve, influence, perhaps the entire world. And I can't help but feel that might be a good thing every now and then. Anyway, have a great week, folks. Have fun, and we'll see you next time.